guys, um, welcome to the next uh, Blind Me. It's only now uh, <coughs> this one has uh, it's taken a while to get here. We've eventually made it. We've had numerous uh, technical faults, including uh, headset problems, microphone problems, and breaking down trains. <laughs> but we're here eventually. Anyway, listen, I'd like to welcome my next guest, uh, Mr. John Packman, extraordinaire Studley. Thanks for coming in, John. Yeah, no worries. Good afternoon to everyone as well. It's been a while since we spoke last. Um, it, certainly, it certainly has. I think the last time we spoke was on the um, it was the podcast without the video. Feature. It was the po- it was a podcast uh, for my uh, it's a sort of computer club that I'm a member of Edinburgh Retro PC. It was yourself and Tony who had it. Uh, That's right. Yeah, it was really interesting yeah. chat as well. It was good, but this, this is my own. This is my own one anyway, so I'll take all the credit for this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excellent. Listen, John, we'll just kick right off. Uh, when did you first discover video games, and what was the very first system that you actually owned? I think when I first discovered video games, it was it was more on family holidays when we used to go to um, to Cornwall when I was a kid. So it would have been probably seventy eight, seventy nine. And thinking back, probably the earliest games I can remember would definitely be Space Invaders. Um, also, vividly remember a, a game called Tail Gunner. I think it was made by Exidy. I can't remember who the manufacturer was. Tail Gunner? Yeah, it always yeah. sticks to my mind. It was either Atari or Exidy or someone like that. But yeah, it was something that always captures my imagination. The first one was Space Invaders, um, of course, because it was like 78. Mm-hmm. Bear in mind, in 78. I didn't see a, a you know a pong game or anything like that because I was only ten at the time. Um, but like most other guys, and probably including yourself, from from that time, seventy eight onwards, it was it was very much accelerated. So from seventy eight to say nineteen eighty eighty one, when I went into the arcades, um, there wasn't many machines um, that that I remember very early on. They all spawned mm-hmm. from basically nineteen eighty. So from asteroids, um, seventy nine onwards. Um, but 1980 was it was when they all really um, they all started coming out then. And um, but the earliest memory would be Space Invaders, and like I said, Tail Gunner was one that really stuck out. It was a, an early vector game. Mm. Mm-hmm. What's quite interesting, one of the sort of features that I have on my YouTube channel, um, I look at sort of arcade games from different years. And I think the first year I looked at was 1975. It was things like Boot Hill. And um, what was interesting, um, the first couple of years, 78, 79, all the games were actually based on time. Yeah. It wasn't really based on lives. It was just time. Yeah. You got maybe like two minutes to play a game. Yeah. Um, and it, it's strange. I think Space Invaders was probably the first game that actually they thought, Let, let's do away with giving somebody two minutes of time. Let's give them lives. Yeah. And then obviously that caught on, and that seemed to be the way it came forward, eh? Yeah, it's, um, and it was, a, it was a challenge as well because it, you had X amount of lives and then the challenge then was to, to you know, keep hold of them lives. Um, I sort of break it down. So when you, you played in the arcades, you had three lives. Your first life was your, um, was your battle cry type of thing. You went into battle. <laughs> your second life was, um, was you trying to hold on and trying to get your highest score. And then your final life was you hanging on by your fingernails. So you were looking at your score to see when that you would get your bonus life, say 10,000 points, for example. Um, but that used to really um, push me on, was the, the, the life thing. That, and that's the way I used to break it down. When I'd, I'd play, I'd, the first life would be so important because you needed to get stuck into the game. Mm-hmm. The second life was you knew you could sort of gauge where you were and what type of score you were going to get. And then on your final life, you really hung on for your, either your, like I said, your bonus life or... Um, your high score. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do, do you find, I find, I mean, I'm not a patch on you at playing video games, obviously, but I tend to find that my first life's the, the life that I get most points from. I very rarely, my, my second life, or right, a third life, I usually lose pretty quick in a game. Yeah, it's, um, what I find is, it, like I said, going back to like the three life thing, even when I play a game that I I'm either don't normally play, um, I always look at it from the first life point of view to to see what score I can get and whether or not the game actually draws me in. Um, mm-hmm. And that's my sort of gauge of whether or not I'm going to enjoy a game. Um, but yeah, as far as like, you know, expertise is concerned, I mean, I'm sure there's games that you play that, you know, you're really good at that I don't play. I think um, going back in the day, you know, the, the very early 80s when I first started playing, I think, you know, that certain people have, have got a, um, a knack of playing certain games. Mm-hmm. For sure. I mean, my brother played Defender. Um, 
to expert level um, in 1980, 1981. Um, and I wasn't really very good at arcade games. It, it, you know, in the early days, I played Berserk initially and then moved on to Pac-Man. He played Pac-Man as well. Um, and he was sort of like the expert, and he's the, the, the first guy that sort of pushed me on, you know, to play in video games. To start playing competitively. You mentioned Berserk used to play. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's just coincidence, really. It's a maze game, and it wasn't... Berserk was a game that drew me in because of the obviously the the vivid colour, the sounds as well. It's, it's, the speech as well, eh? it's some it's, awesome speech. <laughs> it was, and at the time, you'll remember, um, yeah. it was very rare to hear a game with voice synthesis, and I think it, it was definitely the first game that you know you could understand and sort of relate to. And it was mm -hmm. quite a scary game when I was a, a kid, and <laughs> you, you sort of got, um, even on Chasing Ghosts, um, you know, the guys on there, because they, they cover the Berserk game because the um, you know, the likes of Joel West, and he tries to explain what it's like to, to be in the zone type of thing. Um, and they use Berserk and the likes of Robotron and that. And, you know, once you're in the zone and you've become one with the game and be, you've become immersed in the game, you know, that's when it becomes really popular. But, yeah, Berserk was definitely the first game that mm -hmm. you know, I played that really got me hooked on um, on video games for sure. It's such a simple game as well, but it, it looks deceptively easy. And it's it's not is it? I mean it gets it gets very difficult very quickly I find. Yeah, I think it's it's the same with lots of games as well. Once you um um you, you play it in its infancy, you enjoy it, and I, I still enjoy playing video games. But I think as you push your scores further and further, and you, you tend to be, your expertise starts to, to to rise, and then you can, um you compare yourselves to other guys, and your score gets higher and higher. And then when you get to like elite level playing, you're playing for world records. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes the game completely opens up. Then it's it's similar to when you play Pac-Man. I remember playing Pac-Man early in the day. And you you know you get hundreds of thousands of points, and then you get into your millions. And then now you know there's the the difference in getting a kill sc uh, or split screen game of Pac-Man and playing for perfect Pac-Man. It's a massive void. Um, so you you can play Pac-Man up to three over three point two million. And that's great, but the difference in <laughs> difference in that and a perfect game is night and day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. That's a, that's 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 the question one ticked off. <laughs> Tend to <go>. good stuff. <laughs> um, was Liverpool? Excuse me, you're obviously from Liverpool, going by your accent, John. Um, yeah. Was Liverpool? Was that a hotbed in the arcades or for arcades? Sort of back in back in the day, is yeah. Good? Without doubt, there was quite a few arcades in Liverpool, and they were mainly you had the usual um, odd, generic jammer cab, you know, in your chip shop and and the likes. Um, but Liverpool City Centre, um, the arcades were basically around Lime Street Station, you know, the very city centre of Liverpool. Um, the one I used to go in mostly was um, Las Vegas Arcade, which was opposite Lime Street Station, and just around the corner from there, there was another one called the Monte Carlo. So they were the, they were the main arcades and they had all the all the games. Um, but the Las Vegas, uh, it was quite a premier place. It had fruit machines as well. But they had every single one that you can think of. All the laser disc games, um, even the cockpit games. You know, really, yeah, yeah. Games that are so collectible now. And when you think back, even the likes of iRobot, they had the likes of that there. But yeah, it's, they had quite a few. Um, I think for the whole of them, as you said, including Southport, you know where the um, like the Pleasure Beach was, um, it, it's great to think back in them days because there was so many, so many games and the, they were everywhere, literally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it really was a, it was a great place to play, and I played in um, in the Las Vegas every single weekend when I was a kid. <laughs> I had a part time job cleaning cars um, on a Saturday, and come twelve o'clock, one o'clock, I used to meet my friends in in Liverpool, I used to meet in, in the Las Vegas, and that's when I used to play. I really enjoyed it; it was fantastic. So was it just the weekends that you played, or did you sort of play during the week as well? Occasionally, yeah. When I bunked off school, I'd play the odd. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, thinking back, and you, you and your viewers have probably got loads of memories. I remember going into the arcades, and I had a pound. Mm. It was a lot of money then. Um, and bus fare was like five pence to get into town. I'd get into town, and depending on how I'd play, <laughs> it'd be whether or not I'd walk home or get the best. <laughs> but the, the, some of the memories from back then, it's I've got obviously like yourself and other guys who've got hundreds and mm -hmm. hundreds of memories. I, I, one that always sticks out was, um, I remember I got my, it was the first, I think it was the first 
two hundred fifty thousand point game on Pac Man. It was well past the ninth key then because I didn't groove or anything. And I used my last ten pence because I was in really good form, and <laughs> I was so happy. And I remember walking home. It was a five mile walk from town. <laughs> I was walking home, it was still nice weather and everything, but I was so happy that I got my highest score and, you know, I was still really on top of the game. And that's the difference. And, you know, you, you play casually for fun and sometimes, you you know, you play because you absolutely love playing. And I did that. But, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Merseyside was fantastic for playing video games. Yeah, yeah. I think most most big towns in the UK back then had a lot of arcades. I mean, where I came from in, in sort of central Scotland, mm. there was nothing really you had to kind of go into Edinburgh or Glasgow to really get our kind of arcade fix. So yeah, yeah. usually it was when we went and, uh, went on holiday down in England, it was the M6 services. Yeah. And your mum and dad gave you 20 pence and, you know. <laughs> it's a shame as well because I live in Cumbria now. I have done for the last 10 years. And when I speak to the guys, um, and they know like I'm st- still actively play video games, the guys here in the 80s, some of them never even heard of, they'd heard of like some Pac-Man and Space Invaders, but there was hardly any video games in the lakes of Cumbria, West Cumbria. Of, yeah, yeah. The more remote the places, the less um, it was likely to have an arcade. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's a shame because I just grew up with them and it's, you just take it for granted that everyone else went to the arcade, which they didn't. Yeah, I must admit, I mean, most of my arcade games, the, the games that I've discovered for the first time, it was really when Name came along. Mm. I don't think I'd ever, I think I played Pac-Man in, uh, in the States in 1982. I think I had a couple of games. That, that was the only time I ever saw Pac-Man, never saw it in arcades. Mm. And then it's only when Name came along, I discovered all these games sort of thing. So that's why I'm crap at games, and know. <laughs> that's my excuses, and I'll stick with it. <laughs> no, but like I said, Al, it's, you know, I know you've got quite a few questions to go through. Um, to me... I got lots of people saying to me, well, you know, you're the expert at Pac-Man, you, you're great at every game you play. It, and it's not the case. Um, what you've got to remember is back in the day, in the early 80s when I played, I stopped playing in mid, middle of 84, late 84. I spent basically five years concentrating on certain games and, and I played them to death. And mm-hmm. like I said earlier on, it's, it's some people have got a knack of certain games. Um, but it's it was years and years of practice. Um, and... Bill Mitchell uses a you know a famous comment in the King of Kong. You know, there's a level of difference between people, and it relate it translates into some games, and it really does because you can watch other people play games, you watch Tony Temple play the likes of Missile Command, and I'm completely useless and I'm really mm-hmm. competitive. And when he plays, I say, well, I'll have a go, and I have a go, and I get twenty five to thirty thousand points maximum, and that's on normal settings. And he plays on tournament settings and gets in the millions and that's mm-hmm. the difference and you need i separate you know the the fortunate expert elite players with generally people who normally play video games but i don't have that i'm an expert and you're useless i really enjoy when i go to the likes of play blackpool or any of the, the other events i enjoy more standing there watching the other guys play because they have a laugh they have a joke you've got beer in your hand Mm-hmm. coffee or whatever and you see it the games in their infancy the way you used to play when you're back in the arcades back in the day even though there's, mm-hmm. there's always a competitive edge because you see people when they're playing together it's always you get pushed off get out of the way it's my <laughs> bye i'll show you that's it and that's the great part of a video game and i still love that and that's the reason why i go to the events Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll let you move on with the questions because I'm probably going to yeah, no, no, probably answer the you. questions that you're going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's 42 times you know? <laughs> Excellent. Um, excuse me. What have we got here? Um, arcades. Uh, this is a, a stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. Arcades really connected with kids back in the 80s. I mean, what, why do you think that was? I mean, uh, obviously before Space Invaders, I mean, we were playing LCD games and we were playing, I don't know, mechanical games what, what, what do you think really i think you know when i think back for me personally and i don't know whether it you know it relates to anyone else um i was 11 12 13 14 ish when i was going into the arcades and it was almost like a grown-ups place because when you went in there um especially the likes of the last vegas because they had two separate halves if you were underage type of thing it was quite well policed as well you couldn't go near the mm. machines you weren't allowed there yeah, but I mean, I got kicked out all the time from the arcade because you didn't really look up old enough. Or there was a couple of guys used to go around and they used to say, "You've got a credit in the machine," and um, you used to either have ten p in your hand or you used to say yes, and they could <laughs> see whether there was a credit on the machine. 
but it was almost like a, a meeting place. Um, what it was for friends, but mm -hmm. there's lots of older people there. And I think for me personally, it was a, a place to go and where you could, you were really good at something and even older people could watch you play. So it was a, it was a good feeling. And it was one of the, um, the reasons why I found Pac-Man was, I was drawn to that as well, because the cabs they had in the Las Vegas were, were twin screen cabs. So they had a, another 19 inch monitor above, you know. Oh, right, right. you can watch. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, and I, I, they were very rare at the time. They were very expensive as well. But they weren't the yellow cab that everyone relates to Pac-Man, the Midway cab. Um, I mean, nearly all the cabs, that Pac-Man cabs that I saw, I don't think I ever remember seeing a yellow Midway cab. Um, they were either jammer cabs or they were, um, you know, they were bootlegs. But they were, you know, mm -hmm. legitimate boards, but obviously, you know, the difference in shipping a cab in from the States, you know, it was mm -hmm. really, really expensive. But they had two of these and, you know, they were massive cabs. They drew a lot of people over. Um, so, you know, every weekend, a crowded form around. And it's one of the reasons why I want to play now. I'll have a separate monitor where people can watch. But I really thrive off the crowd. Mm -hmm. I've always stood in my lounge and played Pac-Man, which I don't anyway. But if it did... I've, there's there's no um th there's nothing that really keeps me interested yeah you, you obviously feed off the sort of thing there's people watching you hi hi i always played with friends we were always yeah. competitive we all stood over each other's shoulders we gave each other you know thousand yard stairs when we got beat each other's <laughs> it was really competitive. but it really drove us on and it's probably one of the reasons why certain people go on to play games at a very high level and some people keep it as a, a real casual, um, just a casual thing you do. Yeah, it's a hobby type thing. Uh, uh, yeah. It's funny, just uh, slightly changing the subject, I was uh, down at, uh, what was it called, the Arcade Club. I don't know if you saw my pictures on Facebook. I mean, have you been to that at all, John? In fact, you wouldn't have, because it's only been open about a month. Well, yeah, I have. I've been there a couple of times, but um, it, was be it was before it was, you know, the officially um, the Arcade Ah. Uh... It's just one guy's collection. Is it Andy? I think the guy's name is. I think it is. Well, you've got Andy. He's got, I think he's got about half the cabs, but there's lots of the collectors have donated the cabs. Oh, right, right. So he houses the cabs there. Um, James Brindle, RGP, he's, he was like the sort of the originator. He had, um, I think it was 80 cabs at one point in his, in his flat. He had a two bedroom flat. <laughs> and I don't know if, caps. yeah well if you um if you google rgp and you'll see some of on youtube as well you'll see some of the original rgp um videos and he used to have his own meetings so we would go there and that's it was you know the brainchild of andy um james middle rgp so they mm -hmm. put their collections together luke wells lots of other guys and they've um loaned cabs as well so arcade club have got Literally, so it's not just it's not just one guy then, really. Yeah, a few. There's quite a few guys, mm -hmm. but you know the, the main big players are you know Andy, James Brennan, or Luke Wells, and they've done such a fantastic. So you've been there. It's it's a amazing. It really is. I've got to say, I mean, I've been to play Manchester. I was down there two years ago, I think it was. I was in Blackpool last year. I'm going to Blackpool this year. Um, I've got to say, pound for pound, I probably enjoyed Arcade Club more. I mean, it it just had every cab that I could ever want to play. Yeah, that's what they've done as well. Um, the guys from Jammer Plus, I mean, they they did a fantastic job as well. Um, you know, where they got the camps together and you know they invited people around for meetings and that. It really was the community is is a is a fantastic community. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the um, it's such a diverse um, collection of camps that they've got. And when you walk around, and it really is, it's almost like fun spots. Whereas when you Hi. they've got absolutely everything and. You know, you might be into fighting games, you might be into driving games, you might be into maze games, you might be into shoot 'em ups. They've got them all, and they've got all the classics. So oh, nice. it's not we're not doing an advert for Arcade Club, but why not? You know, it's a fantastic community. These guys are yeah. doing such a fantastic job, and you know, hands up to and all the guys who attend as well, because people travel from miles around to go there, and it's well worth it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so you know, if you've got a chance, get yourself there. If you love gaming. It doesn't matter whether mm -hmm. you're five years old or 95, you'll love it. Fantastic. Well, that was the thing. It was a, a wide range of age groups that was here. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only downer is I went, I went down, I met a couple of, a couple of mates I hadn't seen for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of doubling up as a 
going to arcade club and also meeting up with two mates mm. and you've only got like four hours to play and we've probably spent most time just chatting so we didn't get to play that many games you know but um, Andy did get in touch with me he says look if you're ever coming back down again he says give me a shout we'll come to some arrangement maybe open the open it up early for you sort of thing so um, and it's every Saturday as well I know it's it's a, yeah it's a fair distance I've not been there since um, they because they had and he had his own little arcade which was arcade club and then they moved it to it was the New Frontier Arcade, which it was called originally. That was the one in Haslington, but that's now changed the name to Arcade Club. Mm-hmm. So you know there was there was a bit of confusion because you had the two things together. You had RGP Retro Games Party, and you had Arcade Club. So I think you know the the two nearly really need to balance out a bit, you know, and join together, and which they obviously have done. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think the Arcade Club as a logo and as a name. I think it's sort of risen to, to the surface, but James has still got his RGP. And James is a fan. He, James keeps all the cabs going as well. And he's self-taught. And, <laughs> I, I don't know, have you seen any of James's videos on YouTube? Uh, I couldn't see I have any joined that. If you, if you or you, um, any of your listeners, if you put in RGP or Retro Games Party, and you can do it on YouTube, and James does... Um, he, he does his like board repairs and he does um, tuitions online as well. And this guy's self-taught and the, the, some of the things he's done, he's just finished doing a Tron board, which, you know, they're very, very um, difficult to fix. He's just, just done that. And he, he, him and Andy, they've got together, you know, it's, and it makes a great team. And I think that's probably why it works as well. And there are other guys there at um, Arcade Club, but you've been there and you can see it, the lighting, the atmosphere, everything. They've just got... Nice. It was literally like stepping into an 80s arcade. Mm. It really was. I mean, um, you know, just the, the ambience, the carpet, the lighting. Mm. Um, I mean, all the games in close proximity. Yeah, yeah. I would say if, if there was any criticism, I would say it's quite a narrow. If you're standing, it depends on your stance. That's like when my bum went a wee bit, so I was playing something. But I saw it, mean, I've tried to get past you, and then of course you lose a life. But that was, again, that was my excuse. But, you know, absolutely fantastic. I mean, getting to play... Uh, the very last game I played before I left was the Outrun, the hydraulic version. I didn't even know, I didn't even realise that there was a hydraulic version of Outrun. And what a difference. I mean, you're talking about a sprite-based game from 1986, but it's 30 years old. It's See, just having, just having the cheer going like that, it just absolutely opens the game up. It's awesome. Yeah, and another thing to consider, some of the cabs that they've got there, they are quite rare. and um, they've, got, they've, they've had to ship some of the cabs in from Europe as well. I think some of the cabs came from Germany. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So they, they've got them from everywhere. They've spent a lot of money. Um, you know, there's been a great interest, and obviously now it needs the support. So that as many people as, as can go there, and make a, a donation, um, and they're going to have like a membership scheme where you pay X amount, you can go there whatever Saturday you want. But mm-hmm. you would have seen they've got, you know, they have crisps and sweets and soft and stuff. It's just great. You, you, you yeah, a cup of tea and a, a, a topic. You know, what else can you ask for? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I just wish it was a bit nearer. But uh, absolutely fantastic. Anyway, John, good stuff. Right, what am I saying here? Sadly, arcades uh, are nothing more than gambling machines now. Do you think they'll ever see a return to the arcade scene as we knew it? Um, or do you think that technology in the home has now killed sort of hubbing arcade games as a, a viable thing nowadays? Well, to be honest with you, um... In answer to your question, no, it's not going to happen again. I honestly can't no. see it. And I think purely because um, you've got the original arcade machines, which, you know, they've got the normal Cafferway tubes, and you either have them original or you have jammer cabs with LCD monitors or you have um, generic cabs running main, for example, yeah? So I think, no, there won't be a return to the sort of classic arcade scene. But I can honestly see there being video games in an arcade um, sort of atmosphere, like a barcade, for example. There's a few of them. You've got four quarters down in Peckham in London. That's you know it's doing really well. As you know, they've got a um, a games room upstairs as well. So yeah, it, it's a shame. Um, it costs a lot of money as well. So it's either a a venture that mm-hmm. you know you can bring food in and drink or have like the likes of a barcade. I think that works. Um, but the likes of um, the arcades coming back, I, honestly, that wouldn't happen. Yeah, a- I think as well as I mean, it's, you know, we'd, we'd be kidding ourselves if we if we thought that this was 
anything other than a niche kind of interest. I mean, it's, you know, in the scale of, I don't know, how many people in the UK are actually interested would actually go to something like that. It's probably not very much. Mm-hmm. And it's I think that's probably why it's not really a viable um, business. I mean, there was a, a kick, there was a Kickstarter program, um, a Kickstarter uh, thing was put out a couple of years ago, and it was like a group of guys in Edinburgh, mm-hmm. and they were wanting to basically fund this, the, like the biggest uh, arcade in, in the UK. I remember. Um, yeah, I thought it was a bit cheap. I mean, I wanted something like 50 quid, mm. you know, as a minimum. And you still had to pay. I think you got for that, you got to go to the opening night and then they wanted you to pay like £25 a month or something. And yeah. I think they ended up getting something like £5,000 out of the 100 k that they won. You know, it's just this. I think also as well, I remember it at the time because it was on the forums and the business model did, just didn't stack up. Um, no. Nearly all the guys that would go there are now either collectors or enthusiasts. Um, and the only way you can um, keep the interest is if you have the likes of, um, you know, the events like Play, um, where you, and, and you can have them together as retro gaming events. So you've got um, the modern consoles, the modern games, and you've also got the arcade right. section. Because what you'll find is, and you've probably seen it if you've been to any of the events, is that um, a lot of the, the younger the younger kids they go into the arcade and you can't get them out because and it's really down to well, they didn't know anything about these, you know that these early games. Even though when you compare them to the likes of you know PS4 and Xbox, whereas everything is done for you and it's 3D and it's you know super HD graphics, and there's a definitive end into the game um, with the retro games. And they once they start playing them, even though they're quite simple in their nature. Um, the games themselves draw you in, and it, it gives it yeah. gives you a chance to then have your own um, game in your mind, and you, it, it, it's your own imagination that it opens the game up in effect. Whereas in the modern stuff, you know, like I said, it's everything's done for you. So it's I, my, and so you look, you look at something, you think, oh, you know, the latest Halo game, the graphics are rubbish. Or... That's right. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, you know, it's they're fantastic, and I've had an Xbox before. Um, but the only reason why I've not had, I haven't had one recently in the last few years is it's really down to, to Pac-Man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think you concentrate on that. And it, like I was going back to before, you know, the difference in me getting 3.2 to 1 million split screen in 1983 and getting perfect Pac-Man, it's massive difference, huge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, when did you first uh, play Pac-Man, John? You, like, you've always been told us that. And at what point did you realise that you were, you were pretty handy at it? It was the summer of 81. Um, and I remember... When, when, when did Pac-Man first come out? It came out in um, April, May 1980. Um, 1980, was it really? Yeah, yeah and just a, a tiny bit of history before I go on to um, speak about when I actually first started playing it. When it came out, it was tested... Um, you know, they, they put the, the games out and they have, you know, the um, the arcade owners and they invite them to, you know, to like a play test. And it was put out um, by Midway with another game called Rally X. So there were two maze games. Um, mm-hmm. And the feedback they got from the play testing was that Rally X was the game to have. So although Pac-Man was, um, they enjoyed it, Rally X was the game that everyone bought. So I think, if, if I remember rightly, they bought... 10 to 1 Rally X to Pac-Man and that was in the first month um, but the guys who bought the um, the small or the relatively small amount of Pac-Man everyone, the, you know, the coin hoppers were full and, you know, it exploded then because, you know, it's basically the first game that wasn't sort of aimed at um, you know, lads or males mm-hmm. um, and then everyone started playing and I think it just took off then but what attracted me to it was it was basically the summer of 81 I was playing Berserk, and my brother Peter, he used to play, he was, like I said, he was an expert at Defender, but he also played Pac-Man, and he was a 100,000 point player in 1981, and that was that was huge. Um, I played it, Casey, it didn't get it, it wasn't for me. But he used to always invite me, oh, do you want to have a double game of doubles and two-player game? Um, so I used to have two-player games with them, and then I found that, you know, it's, I quite like this, there's more to it than meets the eye, it's not just, what's this? piece of pie shaped thing going around and making <laughs> eating dots and there was a lot more to it and then he used to do i used to watch him and he used to attract the ghosts 
very because in the early days you didn't know you couldn't look into the code or anything you couldn't work out what why things did well the more you played it the more you um you realized and you discovered things opened up and it's going back to what i was saying before um the programmers gave you the basics and then from the basics the more you played the game the more it opened up for you and that's what mm -hmm. happened to me with pac-man and then i started playing it and then i found then that you know I, you know i had this connection with it and i thought right i'm going to keep playing it and then i just found that you know i was i started to get really good at it and there's other guys in the arcades and there's other guys who came in and they were older guys i can't really remember there wasn't i was 12 13 when i first started playing and the guys when i say older guys they were late teens like when you're 12 13 somebody who's 18 or 19 is a man so it was, I was <laughs> almost playing against men in the arcade so it was that was another challenge um and there was even guys who were you know probably 20s and 30s and onwards who played it and they were really good and i used to watch them play and st stood back and had the you know the twin screen you could watch stand back and watch other people would stand and watch and then you'd watch the guys who were you know the really good players especially at the weekend because you had visitors to liverpool and they went into the arcade and everyone wants to to show off how good they were um mm -hmm. so that really i was a a very very um modest player um well not, not modest i was really cocky I wasn't modest. <laughs> so when I when I got really good, I was very confident, and you know, when I was got into the millions, then it was you know I was the best player in the world as far as I was concerned. And that leads on to you know the the reason why when I got back into it, it was the challenge then to beat my old score, but not to do it any other way other than to get a cab because I'd, I'd you know discovered in two thousand and seven that you know there was a perfect impact man and. Bill had done it, and um, and it was always this thing of, do you think I could beat me old score? And you know, a friend of mine, Pat, he said that, you know, he used to watch me play in the arcade, and he said, do you think you could do it again? And I couldn't remember any strategies or patterns or anything, and I thought, well, it's a challenge then. So it was leading up to me 40th, so I thought, let's see if I can do it. So I just invested a lot of time into, into playing. So did so how long did you have like any layoff then, John? When did you stop playing, and when did you resume playing? It's quite a, quite a while. Yeah, I stopped playing. I, went, I left school in late '84. Um, so really, that was then I started working, and I didn't go back into the arcades then because I found that it, basically end of '84, '85, even though I sort of go in the arcade and have a little look, the games that came out then were the, basically the fighting games and um, what was mid '80s to late '80s. So yeah. uh, there was no interest for me. But it wasn't really. I saw the fighting games or you know the, the modern games. They weren't the classic sorts of games that you associate with the, or we associated with the arcades. Um, I'd sort of grown up a bit then, and I, I didn't go to the arcade like I started work. Um, so when guys ask me about you know particular games, or I see certain games, even likes of Outrun, that's way past when I used to play. And uh -huh. that sounds quite odd because my um, the window that, that I played was, like I said, probably 78 to 84. So there was six years of games. Luckily, I look at it luckily for me that the, that was the classic golden age of arcade gaming. Um, because after that, it was um, things tended to change and they changed a lot because the manufacturers, even you know, in the golden age, they were riding on a you know, the crest of a wave and they were untouchable. But once the, the you know, the home arcade consoles, the technology changed, everyone started changing, and it was something that I didn't do, I didn't change to the consoles. Mm -hmm. I just played in the arcades, and that was it. Was the whole experience of being in the arcade, meeting your friends there. Um, I did play at home, I did play friends, had consoles and television and the likes. Um, but yeah, I think I was almost lucky that at the end of the golden age, I started work and I moved on, and then it was mm -hmm. 20 years later when I revisited. So it was 20, 20 years, really, from... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, did you did you immediately go out and at what point did you know you could go and buy a, a Pac-Man cab? Well, it, it, the point was when I, I I was on a forum called ClassicArcadeGaming.com, which is an American forum, and I didn't know anything about UK forums. It was just something that I went online, and the first thing that was there was CAG Classic Arcade Game, um, and it was on CAG that I met the likes of, or I just spoke with the likes of um, Tony Temple. Tony introduced me to Jammer Plus, and he also said, well, why don't you go on the Twin Galaxies website? Um, when I went on the Twin Galaxies website and announced who I was and what I'd done in the past, um, the likes of Walter, Walter Day and Blaine Lockley, who was the chief TG referee at the time, 
they contacted me then and they wanted to try and adjudicate my score from 83. Because in, right. in 83, I knew about TG, I'd have been, you know, unofficial world champion because that right. that beat the score by Tim Balderamos. He had um, the official score. Um, could you go back to then, you know, there's arguments that there could have been a near perfect game then from the likes of Bill and Chris Ira and a guy called Bill Bastable. Um, but they had pictures of near perfect games. But the problem was that everything had to be um, to be done carefully, had to be done in full video, had to be adjudicated. Um, and the, the rules that TG set set out, they, they had to be abided by. And you, you've seen the likes of the King of Kong, um, mm-hmm. the Donkey Kong, on these titles, which became very, very popular. Steve Sanders says in the film, you know, the certain titles that if you want to be classed as world class, you've got a master, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, Gallagher. Um, they were the ones that everyone gravit- gravitated to. Um, but yeah, it was a long time in between playing when I was in the arcades and, and coming back to playing Pac-Man. And how, how sort of long did it take you to kind of get up to the, the standard you were at when you kind of retired the first time? Well, it was initially um, the first cab that I had. And my opinion of MAME has been sometimes contentious on forums because I don't use MAME as a tool to practice, but I've used MAME before because my first cab was a MAME cab and I bought it from Tony. Tony had mm-hmm. a, a MAME cab, a, um, a Japanese candy cab. And that's what I bought. I bought home and I played Pac-Man on that. And it was such a long time that I even forgot that um, actually Pac-Man has a, a leaf spring joystick. When I played back in the day, the cab that I used, like I said, it wasn't a midway cab. And that had, because I always remember, it, it, you could you could hear the joystick clicking. It was a micro switch joystick, and it was mm-hmm. a it was an aluminium point. It didn't have an, even have a knob on the top. And I, <laughs> I always remember that, and that both cabs, it was the same cab. So when I played on the the um, the main cab, which had a you know like a Sanwa micro switch joystick, mm-hmm. I played, got the game back again. Um, picked up some of the patterns, was really back into to playing again. So when I went to Fun Spot and, you know, I got 2 million points or whatever it was, as soon as I got there, their cab was a midway cab. And I never forget, I walked up to the cab and it was, I thought, what's this? It like staring a, a spoon <laughs> in a bucket of cement. There was no clicks, there's no corners like there was with the micro joystick. Mm-hmm. So I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> So I had to relearn everything again. So I thought, well, that's it. I have to get an original cab. That's what I'm going to be. My cab array, I bought it from eBay. It was a wreck. It looked like being dredged from all over the sea. And then just completely <laughs> restored it and made sure it was completely original. And then basically just started again. But it was it was a lot of um, it was a lot of time and effort. Um, and not to use Rack Advance to practice certain parts. But what I did was... and. I'll have to give a mention to the guys who have really supported me and really helped me. The likes of Tim Balderamos. Um, Tim's one of the perfect Pac-Man players. Um, I think he got his perfect game in 2003. He holds um, perfect Pac-Man on um, Arcade and Main. So what Tim did was he did live feed for me because I only wanted to play live. So I was, I was so anal that I only wanted to watch live. So what Tim did was he um, gave me some tuition online on, on Twitch so we we had it was a personal it's like we're doing now in effect and he played on twitch tv and it was like two o'clock in the morning here and he was playing there and i was picking up his freehand grouping because my grouping wasn't up to a standard to do a perfect game so tim did that so i classed it as still being a live game you see so i didn't want to just watch youtube videos or you know, videos. Mm-hmm. I, didn't want to do it. I just I wanted to look over someone's shoulder or just watch someone play live, and you know, pick up the, the things that I needed to do to play live. But yeah, it took quite a while. It was it's it, it took the best part of three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, John. When did uh, you sort of consciously? I mean, did you actually was uh, you're always getting better and better and better at Pac Man, and you knew you, you could uh, you could play a, a game. Uh, did you actually ever consciously decide I'm going to go for the perfect Pac-Man score? Or? Yeah, and uh, like I said, originally it was uh, just a case of I, I wanted to beat my old score from when I was younger. So when I did that, I did that in Funspot in 2009, um, and I did that, lucky enough, 
fortunate in 2009 um, Twin Galaxies were still sort of like the original Twin Galaxies of Walter and the referees attended Fun Spot after 2009 they didn't so I was quite fortunate then. so I did it live at Fun Spot which I wanted to do I wanted to do it live um, when my get when my score was grandfathered into the Twin Galaxy database although the guys in America TG still has and you know, it did definitely have quite a click then. Um, so if you were a, an Englishman or a Scotsman or a European and you went over to America and it was all the jungle drums would ring and say, there's a guy coming over from Europe or England or Scotland or Wales. And they they used, they could have been world champion when they were younger. To get in, to go to a fun spot, to, to mix with these world champion elite gamers, mm -hmm. they're fantastic gamers. You've got to earn your stripes, and you see it with Steve Weeby and the King of Kong. And if ah, you've know, you seen it, oh, he goes there and he has to sort of earn his place. And I did that, and I played live, and I got this split screen game, and it was fantastic. And Walter handed me his phone, and it was Bill Mitchell was on the phone. And I had a chat with Bill, which was brilliant. I was, it really was. And you know, I, that goes on to a completely different story about what them guys do. and you know the misconceptions that people have got the likes of bill um mm -hmm. but when i got it a fun spot um it was really then it was tony then who kept saying to me why don't you go for a perfect game and i kept thinking to myself well hang on for me to get a perfect game i'm gonna have to use rapid vans concentrate on the split screen um get that mapped out in my mind I and mean, i'm not gonna do it playing six hour games so to visit the split screen i'd have to play a five to six hour game could probably do it quicker, not doing free and groove and going for perfect. So I could probably do it in four, four and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So I thought, mm -hmm. no, I just want to do it the old fashioned way. I'm going to play until I get to the split screen and I'll practice on there. Um, I knew where the dots were because I had Tim Balderamas' book as well. Um, and he's he had mapped out the dots. So I knew basically where they were. And you'll probably see if, if some of the guys have probably seen my games when I played live on Twitch. When I got to the split screen, um, I sort of knew where they were, but I didn't. So I had to run around trying to find them. Um, <laughs> so it was difficult. And that obviously made it so much more difficult. And it made it a very long process in in trying to, you know, eventually go for a perfect game. Um, mm -hmm. So see, see the, the perfect game, John, is that the highest score possible? Is that, what, is that what's termed the perfect game? Yeah, with a perfect Pac-Man, like I said before, is there's a... You know, and this isn't to sound elitist at all, because I was in that position where when I got a split screen game back in the day and even guys who can get split screen Pac-Man now, it's a fantastic achievement. It takes a lot of skill and endurance. But the difference in having four lives or having six lives. And the reason why they did that was is because they, they put the live settings on five lives plus one, because when you get to the split screen, every life is worth 90 points. So without getting into... Uh, to, right. to the technicality of it when you when you die on pac-man on the split screen the dots that are in the split screen side they respawn and there's, yeah. there's nine dots there so in effect then nine not or 90 points each life that you've got is worth 90 points so that's another 90 perfect. points right i get you yeah so when i i actually i've had a perfect game but it was called a perfect eat i'd lost the life on board 20 and i, I decided to continue to the end so although I didn't miss anything, and I, I had every single ghost, every single dot, every single power pill, everything I needed to do, I was one life short. So you're 90 points short. Exactly. <laughs> you can still get a perfect yeah. piece of Pac-Man, but you could lose five lives in the process. So in other words, you're going to lose five lives multiplied by 90 points. By 90 points. Uh, yeah. The challenge was, and that's the reason why the likes of Bill and Chris Fothergill, it was USA versus Canada, you know, in the... Um, you know, the late 90s, because without me going into the details of, you know, some of them saying they they had a, or could have got a perfect game back in the day. Well, I don't know about that. But, you know, they they said that at the end of the 90s, they got the, you know, the, the, the key in effect to get a perfect score. So the battle was, it was between the Canadians and the Americans, Rick Fothergill, um, you had Bill Mitchell and Chris Ira, and there were two and fro who would get the first perfect game. Um but yeah, that you know the the difference in a split screen game and a perfect game. See, also with Pac-Man is it, 
what, what drew me to, to eventually go for a perfect game is a, a lot of people class it as like a, you know, a holy grail video game and because there's no other game um, that you have to, you only have one life you can never make a mistake um, you can't miss anything if you make any form of mistake it doesn't have to be a mistake if you lose a life it's you're finished um, <laughs> so to play for that length of time and I was just fortunate that I was you know one of them guys who could play Pac-Man t- to a very high level I thought well the challenge is then there's there's only half a dozen guys in the world in 35 years have got perfect Pac-Man and there's billions of games have been played mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and believe me there's been thousands of people who have tried to do it and there's only half a dozen guys who have done it <laughs> and then you, you, you um you split it up into you know, you know you've got your elite Pac-Man players you've got perfect Pac-Man players and then you've also got guys who played live and that's the reason why I wanted to play live all, all the time because Bill set that benchmark. He played live um, in an arcade environment. And that's not to say the guys who didn't play live who played at home and recorded it are any different. But for me, it was playing live in an arcade. And that's what I did when I was younger. So I wanted to recreate that. Um, so he set that, that precedent. And that's something that you know I wanted to emulate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so even when, when I, I was chatting to Bill and when we went to Free Play Florida, um, and like I said to him, it's because he played live. That's exactly the reason why I want to do it. And we shared lots of things in common as well, as far as you know, Pac-Man was concerned, and the way we play. You know, it was really interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So just to, 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 to let people understand just what you actually achieve, the perfect Pac-Man score. It's getting every single dot. Um, it's getting. Is it level two hundred fifty-six? Is that when the? In fact, can you explain this? The split screen to people, John. Yeah. That occurs on level 256, I think it is. Well, I'll do is I'll divide it into what I would um, class as a simplified version. Okay. When I start out to play, there's three different phases in a, in a, in a game of Pac-Man for me. You, I've got my first phase, which is board one, which is the cherry, to board 21, which is the ninth key. Okay. So for the first 20 boards, yeah, to the eighth key, I need to make sure that I've at every single dot, every single power pill, every single ghost with them power pills, regardless of whether or not it's a one second power pill, all them ghosts need to be eaten. So for, for me, it's one of the hardest parts of that th- the, the three different sections of playing a game of Pac-Man. When I've done that, and that takes about two hours to do, to play that freehand without any patterns. So I, I need to be perfect on board 21, which is 356, 600. Then from 356, 600, which is ninth key, I run a pattern then up into board 255, which we class as what's called crossing the desert. So that's <laughs> depending on what pattern you play. I play an old pattern that I used back in the day. Um, so th- that typically takes another nearly three, three and a half hours. And people look at that and think, well, he's just running the same pattern. Once you've already played perfect to board 20, you need to then be corner perfect through another, you're up to board 255, so you've got 230 boards of being corner perfect. When I say corner perfect, it's because what happens with a lot of people is when they get onto the ninth key and they say, well, I know the pattern on the ninth key. I did, you can run a ninth key pattern, but as soon as that pattern breaks down, and it will, as soon as you hesitate in the corner and you do, your pattern breaks down, the ghosts go a different way, you get calls. If you, <laughs> if you can't freehand group, which is knowing how to group the ghosts together, how to evade them, how to keep them in a tunnel. If you can't do that, you will then start losing lives. I was at a point when, you know, I went to Fun Spot where I, I did exactly that. My pattern broke down and I died twice, but I still got to the uh, the, the split screen at the end. With, yeah, but you, yeah. With the perfect Pac-Man, you cannot make any mistakes. You can't lose a life. So if your pattern breaks down, uh, you need to be able to freehand group, otherwise you're probably going to lose a life. That's the second phase, and that takes hours and hours. And bearing in mind that when you're playing this, when you're in a live arc environment, you've got the sounds of everything around you. You've got people who are talking. You've got people making announcements on stage. You've got everything around you. And it's mm-hmm. really loud. So you've got to concentrate, and the con- concentration that you need to do that, you know, you really need to... Um, it's a massive concentration. Then when you get to the end, you've been playing for so long that... I mean, fatigue kicks in. It always hits me at 2 million points for some reason. I don't know if it's psychological. I'll look up and think that it's, <laughs> it's rolled over for the second time. And I'm thinking I've got another 1.3 million to go. 
it's a long way. If I can get through that, and I, I normally do, um, you, you then hit the kill screen. 255, you know what the score is, if the score's coming off, and then the kill screen um, comes on, and you've got to remember what to do on the kill screen. Because I did it live on Twitch TV, and I was perfect. That was my chance to get the first perfect game. I was still at all the lives, didn't make any mistakes. And the first, as soon as the kill screen came on, I was blank and I made a mistake and died right at the beginning of the kill screen. So, yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that was like six hours that was play six led up to that point and you lost a life and that was your 90 point score. Yeah, no, yeah. Some people might think, well, what's the point of playing Pac-Man for six hours? The point is that that's the challenge. For me, there's no other challenge yeah. in, in arcade gaming. F for you to drop a coin, for you to never make a mistake, for you to never miss anything, and to be perfect at the end, that there's no other game with where you can can't lose a life. Even if you look at the likes of, you know, Missile Command, what Tony does on that is um, absolutely astonishing. What what, what mm -hmm. we can do, but you've still got six cities, and in effect, you've got six chances. Although you lose, yeah. you lose your cities earlier on, and then you def you defend either one or two cities. You've still got a, a four or five mistakes that you can make. With a perfect game, there ain't no mistakes. There's, uh, there's no room for error at all. It's that's, that's perfect. It. And it's so. the amount of people that have actually done a perfect game. It's because, like I said, there has been thousands, lots of people who have attempted it, and that's the attraction, and that's what keeps me focused. And you know that's exactly why I still want to get a perfect game. It's being so close, but being so far. There's a difference in 90 points and being with, <laughs> with the guys who have had perfect games and, you know, they're, they're amazing players. So you see this, that you're calling the, the, the kill screen, is that the same as split screen? It's the same thing, John? Is that the two different terms? It's the same thing. Sometimes I say kill screen because I'm so used well, to, yeah. you know, Donkey Kong, everyone says kill screen. But yeah, to split screen because, you know, in, it, in effect, the screen is divided into two halves one half is a intact maze um and is that the left left hand side of the screen is okay and the right hand side is just garbled, sort of garbage yeah and it's always the same as long as you're playing on the original um the original hardware the original pcb it's always the same and you've got what the hidden dots that, that are in that split screen so are you kind of moving about under within the garbage side of the screen picking up points is that how that works yeah there's there's nine there's nine dots there um and I won't go into the details of, you know, well, how do you know where them nine dots were? Mm -hmm. Found them out. How could you possibly do that? Because for me in the early day, when I got to the um, the split screen, it, it was like, well, you got caught in there. You wouldn't think, hang on, th there must be hidden dots. Everyone thought at the time that the, once they'd cleared the left-hand side, that was it. no, there's a way through here. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? So what they did was, even back in the day, th because Pac-Man had a rack advance, the guys in 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 the states they they either had their own Pac-Man cabs or, you know, they, it was so popular then you could buy your own cab. But for me and you know I talked to my friends who were at the arcades and guys back in the day yourself or whoever. Did you ever see anyone using a rack advance on a Pac-Man machine or did you ever know anyone who had to stay behind an arcade or did anyone have their own arcade machines? I didn't. Yeah. It was completely different in America because. They had literally thousands and thousands more cabs than we did. So probably a lot more going for not, not very much money. Right? Well, it was massive, and like I said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for us it was the arcade. It was that's all you did, and the only time you saw an ar the, the door open, the coin door or the back door, was when there was a technician fixing a game. You know, it, these guys back in the day, they had they had a button they could press to rack advance the game to practice on a, on a split screen. But like I said, that that tends to go into a bit of bit more of a contentious thing that, that I've got with guys who played back in the day and used Rack Advance. So it's something that, you know, I personally wouldn't, wouldn't use because I didn't use it back in the day. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, to get there, to complete it, to clear the split screen and to do it on one life, it's, you know, it's for me, it's, it, it's, it's a massive, you know, achievement. It's a massive incentive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't play Pac-Man very... I'm, I'm not particularly fond of the game, I have to say, but, you know, if I can get to third or fourth screen, that's about my limits. I mean, to get to a 256th screen without losing the life or, you know, it's just it's an incredible achievement. But you, you'll see also, Alan, and it's it's something that people have seen when they've watched me play live, 
there's a difference in playing it when you play it casually and you have a bit of a laugh and a joke and mm-hmm. and it is that's great fun when you play with your friends lots of people have seen me play live when i i get quite poker faced because you have to really concentrate uh, I, I have, you, you, you do because I think I, I, I met you um, at Blackpool, not Blackpool, it was Manchester, mm. and I didn't know you at that point. Mm. And I remember standing beside you, and you were just concentrating. And I was talking to Tony, and I thought this guy looks a bit serious. <laughs> As you say, you're just in the zone, you're totally concentrated. And it's it, it's going back to what I was saying before that it's it's one thing playing in an arcade environment, which is mm. because you you've got I mean you need to have it slightly cordoned off as well because when you're playing for a perfect game. Like I said, you can't make any mistakes whatsoever. If someone comes up to you and pats you on the shoulder and says hello, and yeah, there's a mistake, and you've you've finished. I could have been playing for an hour or two. I could have been playing for four hours. It looks a bit elitist with a rope round, but you do need that space for mm-hmm. sure. You you know you have to concentrate. Um, mm-hmm. But like I said before, I absolutely love it. It's to be able to concentrate for that length of time. To try and get with these guys who have, you know, achieved almost the impossible. But when you watch me play live, when you watch me f- to freehand group the ghosts, it's a completely different game. Completely. Not to use patterns to um, manipulate the ghosts to do what you want them to do. Um, mm-hmm. it, it clicks in either you enjoy doing it or you don't. And there's lots mm-hmm. of guys who are, who are really good at playing Pac Man, but they don't know how to freehand group the ghosts together. And that's part of the game that makes it really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. I think that's one. Yeah. That's that's one thing that I've kind of noticed with like video games. I mean, probably um, Donkey Kong, watching the King of Kong. Mm. On the on the face of it, you you, you load up any of these games, Pac Man, whatever it is, and you think, all oh, right, I've got to eat the ghosts, whatever it is, or avoid the ghosts, eat the power pills. Mm. They, they look very very simple, but all these games, there's a lot of little hidden. Not secrets as such, but when you get into the meat and bones, you get to understand how the codes work. So there's lots of little tricks, and you know, even like in Donkey Kong, I think you see Steve Reby kind of shakes the joystick left and right, mm-hmm. and that forces the, the barrels to come down. Yeah. That's things that people would never ever know about well, unless you play it a lot. Yeah. That's right, and that's the thing. Yeah. That you know, this is pr- a lot. You know, we're talking 17 years before Mame even came out. People were playing these games so often. Um, there were so many people playing them and so many people watching people play that just the tiny little nuances in the games that you picked up, and I did it myself, you watched people play who were your competitors in effect when you were really into gaming and you picked up their strategies or their tips or their skills and you and their skill sets you formed part of yours and that's the, the, the beauty of you know retro gaming is that you can watch someone play um, you can watch mm-hmm. someone make a mistake and incorporate that into your game so it doesn't you don't do it yeah so there's mm-hmm. so many different things within the game that you you can you can discover um and when you put that all together especially with pac-man and once you free and group the ghosts and to get it perfect and to never make a mistake and then that's the you know that's the goal for me for sure mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so see i actually googled it um john they're saying here that a guy don hedges i think i've heard of him have you heard of him don hayes Don, is it pronounced head? Was it Hedges? H E D G E S? No, it's actually Don Hayes. H A Y. Oh, is it? Well, that's that's Wikipedia for you. <laughs> um, he was. He seems to think that the error on the level two five six occurs as the game isn't. Able, it's trying to draw the two hundred and fifty six piece of fruit or something. That's what causes it to yeah. take any crash. Uh, I mean, I'm not a coder and I'm not into that side of the game. But from what I understand is, it was based on the the, the eight bit. Um, computer um, technology and then when it got to 256 it was a multiplier of eight um, and then there wasn't enough memory to draw so the buffer put this on the screen um, but just as you mentioned in Don Hayes Don Hayes is you know I meet Don every time we go to to fun spot Don's quite a good friend of Sony and mine mm-hmm. Don is arguably you know the, the the greatest retro gamer that there's ever been um, really yeah. He holds. He's just te- taken the Dig Dog World record back, which has seemed impossible. Don's had perfect Pac-Man as well, so <laughs> we we call him Don Bot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's Joust World Champion. Everything. He's amazing. Wow. Amazing guy. Amazing player. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So, who was the first to achieve the, the perfect score? Well, the, the, the first guy to you know for it to be 
you know, demonstrated was Bill Mitchell. There's um, Billy here. Yeah, yeah. I said before, there, there was other guys who, who were capable of doing it. And Bill Bastable, he was a, a, a guy, you know, very early 80s, and he's a fantastic player. But there were so many guys playing Pac-Man, like I said, and the majority of them were in, you know, the likes of North America. Um, and that's probably why they own all the world records on the classic arcade games. But you know yourself, you went to arcades back in the day, and I did. There's, there's some amazing players in the UK. There's some mm-hmm. amazing players in, in Europe. But we didn't have Twin Galaxies, and it wasn't as big as America. Um, no, no. You know, it was huge there. And the cream of the, the games in America, the who rose to the top, the likes of Bill, the likes of Chris Ira, um, and all the you know the, the guys that you've seen in the King of Kong, they, they've almost become... Um, you know, real celebrities in gaming because they did so much then. Todd Rogers as well, yeah. Steve Sanders. Mm-hmm. Um, because of what they did, and they, they wore the scores on the, the, the shirts, and in fact, they were world champions at the time. But, you know, that's not to say that there wasn't competition in Europe, in, a, in the UK, and there was, and it was me on Pac Man, and it was Tony on Missile Command, and there was mm-hmm. whoever on different games. It's just a shame that, you know, there wasn't Twin Galaxies and something which force us together or the internet if we had the internet then it would, yeah it would have been different but in answer to your question yeah it was bill um and you've got to give you've got to give bill a lot of credit for that because although he's he's taken a lot of knocks over the years bill you know because of the king of kong i was just going to say that he was perceived as a bad guy obviously in, in that film yeah i mean i spoke to, yeah i spoke to bill about it and i said that you know i don't want to talk about it because it's something that he doesn't really well he doesn't speak about because it's not import, that important um but he laughs it off anyway and you know what that guy has done for for competitive gaming and if you went to any of the events the likes of free play florida or even you know in the early days he goes to all these events with richie knuckles and walter and you know the show that these guys put on and they're very supportive when you meet him you know he's completely different so i'll say to anyone who's got an opinion about bill being uh, you know a bugger or a scoundrel or that's how he was portraying king of kong and it was a oh. it was a great film king of kong and they were clever in what they did um but it did upset a few people and he's nothing like that bill and real mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. yeah going back to the original question and the first guy to do it was was bill mitchell and it was bill yeah yeah as much, so, as much as there are guys who say that no he didn't there was other guys it was proven that he did it it was videoed yeah he was the first guy to do it and he did it live for fun spots um so he did it live so as i'm concerned that's the benchmark and that's the reason why i'm doing it the same way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. good brilliant um, how many others have achieved that, that you're aware of the perfect game Sorry, it's sorry, um, Alan. I didn't quite catch up. What was that? Yeah, how, how many others have achieved the perfect game that you're aware of? Oh, it's definitive. It's um, there's there's now seven guys. There only used to be half a dozen. So you've got Bill. Um, I'm trying to think of the guys who have done it in order. So you've got Bill Mitchell, um, closely followed by Rick Fothergill, um, because they were in. Remember, I mentioned they were in competition with the other Canadians and Americans. Um, there was meant to be a bit of an agreement that. They were both going to play at Fun Spot in '99, um, and there's, I think Bill broke the agreement and he, he went to Fun Spot earlier than Rick because they were <laughs> both so close to doing it live. And Bill did it first in '99 when he did it in July '99. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So within a, I think it was within a couple of months, Rick Fothergill got his perfect game. Um, he videoed his game, so it was Bill, Rick Fothergill, Chris Ira, who was the other. I really class Chris as probably the, the greatest um, Pac-Man player because he was so good at Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man at the time. Because in 82, I think it was, or 83, he was an 800,000 point player on Ms. Pac-Man, which was unbelievable. And that record's stood, you know, till quite recently. So it was Bill, Rick Fothergill, Chris Ira, and then it was Tim Balderamos, who I mentioned before, who's massively supportive of my game. And, you know, I've really got to give a, a, a big shout out to Tim. You know, mm-hmm, he's done mm-hmm. so much for my game. Don Hayes, yeah, Don got the perfect game then. Um, then it was Dave Race. Dave has also got the fastest perfect Pac Man. And most recently, it was a guy called David Cruz. Now, David, um, who, who now plays, he's playing Tron 
well, he's world record holder at Tron. Um, he played in an I can't remember where he played, but he played a live game as well when he got his perfect game, which has just been um, adjudicated by Twin Galaxies. So big thumbs up to um, to David Race. He was at Free Play Florida as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a, there's a slight difference as well because some guys play freehand and some guys don't because when um, Dave Cruz was watching me play in Florida, he was amazed. I was thinking, well, what are you amazed with? He said, I've never seen anyone play like this. And because he doesn't play freehand, he plays patterns from, from the first board, you see, um, which takes a lot of skill because you've got to execute the pattern. Um, but there's a difference in playing pattern than playing no patterns. So, yeah, Dave was the most recent one. So there's seven guys now who've done perfect game. So, one. Yeah, it's, what's interesting is it's like the four minute mile. I mean, it took all these years for Roger Bannister to do the four minute mile. And within two weeks, I think about three or four people have done it. And it sounds, it's almost like when somebody proves what people thought was impossible to be possible, it can be people have got. Like, I'm going to have a shot at this, so I'm going to, I'm going to do it, and it becomes that wee bit easier because somebody else has already proven that it is, that it is possible. Yeah, that was the thing as well. I, I don't know, it's going back to what I was saying before, and it's very difficult to try and explain it without sounding really elitist. Mm-hmm. There's been so many games being played. It's the biggest game in history. It's the most iconic game in history. Billions of games have been played. So many people have wanted to get, because the perfect game has been known about for 15 years now, is it really? Yeah. Yeah, it's 99 when Bill got the first one. And mm-hmm. the perfect game has been known. Right, I can't. In America, the perfect game has been known well before then, obviously, because obviously they were playing up to like a perfect standard. Um, but as far as we're concerned, you know, the knowledge has been there for 15 years. So there's a lot of amazing players who can play, and there's so many people who have tried and failed, and me being one of them as well. So mm-hmm. it's, it's still something that I've got to tick off. So was it something that somebody got to the 256 screen and then it crashed they thought hey brilliant well done high score and then somebody thought wait a minute there might be place if we can move into this part of the screen so was 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 there all i mean was there previously they thought this was the best you can do who actually initially thought i'm going to see if there's any power pills in in this side of the the screen or not power pills dots no what it was is like i said before um the idea was that hang on this can't be the end of the game there must be a way through so uh right, right. So i spoke to the likes of tim yeah because tim balderamos played the same time similar age to me and uh, the, you know the notion was with them was there must be a way through but i was thinking the opposite that i didn't know about you know there's a way through as far as i was concerned when you got to the split screen whatever score you were on was the score you were going to get because mm-hmm. there's hardly any points on the split screen is there Mm-hmm. There isn't. There's only two thousand points on the split screen, so I thought to myself, well, when you get to the ninth key, because the power pills never change. So say me and you were playing together on a, on a Pac-Man cab next next to each other. If we both get to the ninth key at the same time, yeah. If I'm on three hundred thousand and you're on three hundred twenty, if we both get to the end, you will have get a high score, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the, you you can't. There's no power pills. You can't hit any more points. So it's 12,600 points per board after the ninth key, end of story. So the, the time for you to score extra points is in the first 20 boards. So that's, mm-hmm. what the, that's what I was doing back in the day. I thought, well, I need to score as many points as I can, get as, eat as many ghosts as possible. So when I get to the ninth key, when I get to the split screen, I'm going to be on a higher score than the guys. Are you with me? And that, I, what, what you're saying is you're sacrificing lives and, and just keep redoing the first screen. The most important thing was was for, mm-hmm. for the boards where you can earn points, okay? Now, the boards mm-hmm. where you can earn points are the first 20 boards because when, uh, you, when you eat a power pill, that gives you the opportunity to, to get 200, 400, 800, and 1,600 points, yeah? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. cumulative, each um, power pill that you eat is 3,000 points, yeah? Right. If you're on the 157th key, they don't work, so you run on a pattern. You can only get 12,600 points. Are you with me? Ah, right. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. The only opportunity you've got to, and it, this is the reason why you've got to be perfect on the on ball 21, is because you're going to run a ninth key pattern then. You've had all your chances before then. You have to be perfect up to ball mm-hmm, 21. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even back <laughs> in the day, when I got to the first game, I thought, 
well, when I get on to the ninth key, whatever score I'm on is going to dictate what score I'll get when I get to the end. Yeah. So to, just to simplify things, say I was on the ninth key, for example, I use the ninth key because if any of you, the guys on your, um, your podcast aren't familiar with, there's a massive change in the game because when you start the game on the, the cherry board, the game progressively gets slightly faster up into what's called the first apple. Now, you'll notice on Pac-Man, on the first apple, he travels really quickly. Man. Now, he stays at that speed until the ninth key. On the ninth key, he slows down. But the ghosts oh, really? mm -hmm. stay at the same speed, which is quick. Mm -hmm. And that was the stumbling block for everyone who played back in the day, because when you got the ninth key, the, the power pose didn't work, and you were slower. You got caught very quickly. Mm -hmm. until you knew the pattern for the ninth key. <laughs> So going back to what you were saying before, the guys who were thinking ahead, and I, I or probably I was one of them thinking, well, hang on, the, the game's going to be won in the early days, so if you get as many points as possible while you can earn points, and that's mm -hmm. to eat as many ghosts as you can. And that's what happened then was the guys realised, well, hang on, there's no end to this game. That is, the, Well, that's the end, in effect. We need to eat everything. So the challenge was then that even on what's called the, the one-second boards, a one-second board on Pac-Man is the first one is your first Galaxian. Okay, so on board nine, you've got a Galaxian, which is, um, I think it's actually 1.1 seconds if you time the stopwatch. But you have to eat all four ghosts in one second. <laughs> mm. I think Bill famously does a, a demonstration on, um, I think it's King of Kong, when he's sort of showing off an effect. He says, well, I'll show you how quick a one second board is and he goes to one of the power pills and the ghost flash i think that they flash six times very quickly on and off white and blue and it's just over a second so you've got to eat them all so that then the the skill almost then it was to was to group the ghosts together so they were all on top of each other in effect aye, aye, aye. and then you had to bring them to the power pill when you when you felt they were grouped together correctly I could go into so much detail about what happens when you, <laughs> as soon as you touch that power pill, and you have to have them in effect stacked in a, in, a, in an order for certain power pills, because mm -hmm. they will split at, a, at different ways, mm -hmm. and that's going into the very very fine detail of, of the perfect game. You have to think of so many different things as the game's progressing, because you can see in your peripheries different things that are going on when you're grouping the ghosts together. So many different things can happen, um, and when it comes together. It's a great feeling because you're in that zone and you're, you're one with the machine and you can, mm. you can really connect with the likes of what Joel was saying in Chasing Ghosts. When everything becomes blared and you can't hear anything around you, all you can hear is that woo, 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 woo. <laughs> and people, people sometimes say to me, that does that drive you mad? And no, it doesn't because when you become one with it like that, that's all you can hear. And if you can get from the beginning to the end and if you can last for six hours, that's when you, you've managed to put it all <laughs> Awesome. Um, you, you obviously came, in fact, sorry, I'm skipping a question here. Would you say you're fairly well known in the States? I mean, I think in retro circles you're, you're pretty well known in the UK, but are you pretty well known in the, in the, in the States for being a, a good Pac-Man player? Yeah, it's, um, in the last, yeah, probably in the last few years. Um, I think it's, it's since the, you know, my score was grandfathered in as the, a, a, a score from the 80s. Mm -hmm. So, it, it had quite a bit of quite a bit of gravity that because of the implication that my score was you know the world record score at the time. So, it opened um, quite a few arguments up as well because you know there was guys saying, well, okay, well you got that, you know, what could you score now? And and that's what led on to me going over to Funspot and Tony said, well, why don't you go up to Funspot and play live? Um, so yeah, I was well known for for playing a live game because that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I was also quite well known for the opposite, probably a negative reason. And that was um, sticking to, you know, playing live in an arcade environment, not using emulation. Um, and I've used it, like I said before, you know, I'm the first guy to say, yes, of course I've used an emulator because my first cab was a main cab. Mm -hmm. And I remember once that one of my friends wanted to, to know an, what I call an apple pattern, a clearing pattern, because I don't use patterns anymore. I showed and I recorded um, with a video camera. I rack advanced up to the first apple, 
and then I record sorry the second apple and then I recorded an apple get an apple one board and then I sent him that so he could practice <laughs> it really helped his game because he used that pattern. Mm. and I had to be really careful because I remember one of the guys in America said well you say you've never used an emulator you don't use rack advance well I don't because I don't need to because I don't need to practice how to play Pac-Man because I know how to play um, but once you once you say something, you say, "Well, I don't use rapid advance. I don't use emulation." You've got to be careful because. No, I think it was stuck. <laughs> yes, I have because name got me back into to classic gaming. Mhm, mhm. Mm <laughs> you, you obviously came very close. Was it last? Was it last year, John? Was that you? Yeah. Where you just you, you lost your life on the kill screen? Yeah, it was. It was um, arguably the closest I got. Alan was the year before because that was on Twitch TV because like I said before I was perfect on the split screen so I still had all six lives but I messed up at the beginning of the split screen so it was game over but the highest score I got was last year but I lost the life on board 20 and what really missed me is that I didn't make it I made a mistake but I didn't I didn't class it as a fault because what happened was and you can I heard it on the recording and I'll never forget it the stage was right behind me where I was playing and the cosplay it was really loud, wasn't it? <laughs> well, they were judging the cosplay. And I remember I was clearing board 20, which is the eighth key. So I was thinking, right, ninth key, I'm on the run to the split screen. I was point perfect. And they shouted, hello. <laughs> and I hit myself. <laughs> and I was clearing the last few dots. And I made a mistake. I just couldn't help it. I lost concentration, lost the life. Oh, no. and then I blew it and, and I was looking around a couple of the guys watching they said just keep playing just keep playing so I played then to the split screen and I was one life shows and so you knew you were never going to get the perfect perfect game at that point but I you just knew, kept going yeah and I needed the practice to be honest because like <laughs> not practice much on the, um, on the split screen so mm -hmm. it was a bit more practice on the split screen so it ended 90 points short so efficiency mm -hmm. was the highest score because it's classes of perfect ease but it was one life short so I can go on as long as I want about the uh, perfect <laughs> game. But, you know, people look at that and say, well, that's bloody hell, that's very close. 90 points is 90 points. Uh, I'll just mention also, there's a guy in Canada called Greg Secundiak. Now, Greg's been a massive supporter of my game as well. A few of the times I've played live at Blackpool, I've actually streamed as well. I'm going to stream as well in this one. So you'd be able to watch it live online. Greg's played at the same time in Canada he's one dot 10 points away from a perfect game <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a guy greg as well so he's one one dot away from a perfect game so he's got my sympathies um but yeah we've we've become really close because of that and i support his game and he supports mine so yeah it's it's sort of a competition now um canada versus the uk so you can be next who's gonna get there first <laughs> Brilliant. So how, how long does it take you to get the, to the sort of kill screen then, John? You think about yeah. six hours? Mine is always, it's it's quite consistent, yeah. It's, it'll be around about six hours to six hours, 20 minutes. Mm. So, yeah, it's, um. so when I play, say I'm in Manchester, for example, if I make a mistake in the early boards, which, like I said, the first 20 boards is when you've got to do your freehand grouping. If I make a mistake and miss a ghost or miss anything, it's, I'm, it's game over, so you've got to reset. Because I've got a six hour window, if I say the event closes at 6 p.m., the latest I can start for a perfect game is 12 noon. So I need six hours. If I start the game at 12 noon and I make a mistake and it's an hour into the game, I don't need to speak to the, the event organizers because I'm going to go over 6 p.m. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've only got, in effect, two chances per day. So I'll have three days at the event. Right. And what I've sort of found is before, um, I've not played for six months now. I, the last time I played Pac-Man or touched, because I don't have a cap here. Um, the last time I played was in Manchester in October. Um, and the cab was faulty and, you know, there's a few gremlins and I, there's nothing that was up my hand, so I couldn't do anything. Um, but I've not played for six months. So what I'll do is on the Friday when I arrive at, um, in Blackpool, I'll play for an hour or two. And I'll do what's called a bit of free hand group and so just get back into the, the swing of things. But yeah, I'm hopeful to do it on the Saturday and that leaves 
Sunday and Monday to do some different. No, I hope so because that's the only day I'm going to be there. So I want to be there to witness it. Bring some beer and be normal. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> okay, John. Um, now, when I was at uh, Blackpool last year, I noticed uh, there seems to be a, a sort of safe spot in the maze where you can actually park Pac-Man, mm. and the ghosts just don't seem to kind any go near them. Um, where is that and is there something you need to do to activate it or is it something anybody can do or is it does it only occur after a certain point or something another one of them questions which which can have a, a really simple answer or can have a, mm. an in-depth answer i'll make it as basic as i can back in the day um even before you know the, the sit spot or safe spot or whichever you want to call it these are the type of things that were, that came across accidentally you would either stop you think, right, I'm not going to resume a game. And I remember clearly watching a guy and he stopped in one of the sit spots in the bottom right hand sit spot. It, you've got a t there's a T shape under the ghost box. You, you, it's a popular one that most people use. Um, and I remember there was a guy sat there and the ghost went going there. I thought, hang on a minute, what's, what's, what's this? Is something wrong with the game? And then he stayed there. And I remember he was fumbling around getting some change out of his pocket because he lost two lives. And so he just left it there. And it was almost like you're going to walk away from the cab. And he stayed there. And that's the first time I ever saw a sit spot or a hiding spot. And it was only later that I found out that, you know, there was certain um, in the program, if if the ghost didn't see you at a certain point. Now, the way I, I'll simplify a sit spot for you now, when you get, when the ghost, at the beginning of a game, you'll see that you start off. And what happens is the ghosts go into what's called um, the patrol. And you'll see that each ghost has got a corner, okay? And from the, they come up the ghost box in the center and they split to their corners. Yeah. So it's something that, you know, even your viewers, if they go into main uh, or they play Pac-Man, they, they'll pick up these things and they'll remember it and incorporate it into the game. So at the very beginning of the game, all the four ghosts split to their corners. Okay. Blinky, the red ghost, will go up to top right hand corner. Pinky, obviously the pink ghost, goes up to top left hand corner. Pokey or Clyde, always called Pokey, goes to the bottom left bottom left hand corner and Inky the blue ghost that's his domain is the bottom right hand corner now you instantly know that as a as a mm -hmm. player that's where they're going so the beginning of the game put your coin in press stars that's where they're going now what they do is they patrol their corners for the first x amount of time and you'll see they do what we call a reversal they reverse and they come back into what I call pursuit so you've got patrol and pursuit so the beginning they patrol so I don't know you know whether or not that was the um, the programmer's intention that they were going to patrol their power pills because when you start off when you were begin to play pac-man you run for the power pills so although you want to clear dots you think if i get a power pill i can clear as many dots as possible so the beginning of the game you'll probably see that um beginners run for a power pill eat a power pill and then eat clear as many dots as possible but at the beginning of the game the ghosts have already split to their corners patrolling the power pills so they do that for a certain length of time it's only about 15 20 seconds and then they do what's called a reversal so they, they reverse back and they pursue you yeah so when they're pursuing you then they don't patrol their power pills so that gives you the opportunity to then go to any one of these power pills and use the power pill in effect if you watch that then when you eat a power pill the ghost reverse again to run away um during a game, the ghosts do X amount of what's called reversals. So they patrol and pursue. Mm -hmm. This happens five times or one, two, three, four, five. And these are called reversals. And I count these reversals at the beginning of, um, of boards. So once these reversals are finished, they only do X amount of reversals. You'll probably find that when you play Pac-Man, you'll be running around and all of a sudden they'll turn and bump into you. That will be in a reversal. When the reversals are finished, they're more predictable because you can actually follow them indefinitely with the knowledge that they're not going to reverse. Ah, right. So when they're in patrol for yeah. uh, patrol mode, they're not looking actively looking for Pac-Man then. They're patrolling their power pills. They ain't looking for you. No, I don't. You when don't they know. do their pursuit, what I call p patrol, mm -hmm. pursuit, when they pursue pursue you, they're looking for you and. It, 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 the, the program doesn't see you as a um, as Pac-Man. It sees you as a pixel or a dot. Um, and Not a coordinate. <laughs> that's right. It's a basic coordinate. And uh, the ghosts are separate coordinates. And the program says, get that coordinate. And they've got certain in interception points. And based on them interception points, that's the reason why in some places 
they can't see you in effect. But the only way that works is when they when they patrol their, their power pills, they can't see you. If you get into a certain point, yeah, when they reverse and come back, they need to try and find you. And they're not looking for Pac-Man in a maze that we see. They're looking for a coordinate, exactly what you just said. It's a good way of putting it. They're looking for this pixel on the screen. And each ghost has a different interception for that pixel. And if you're in a certain point at a certain time, they don't know you're there. Oh, right. But there is other ways that, like, to play a perfect game, you can actually manipulate the ghost to get stacked on top of each other. And you can actually put the ghost in certain points where they can't get you. They travel north instead of, you know, traveling <laughs> towards Pac-Man. And you can trap them around the ghost box, and you can be in a certain point. Um, but these are these are things that you, you pick up after countless hours of playing the game. Um, mm -hmm. And you see lots of things in Pac-Man in your periphery, like we're saying. You concentrate on where you're traveling, but you see things going on around you. Your periphery is a big part of when you're playing. Um, and another, That's, thing, yeah. another thing that you've got to be really um, confident with is that's traveling around the maze and being what's called corner perfect. So it's doing pre-turns. So you don't want to pause or hesitate in corners at all because what happens in effect is the program sees you as running a different, they see you as running a different pattern. Um, if you stop, they react to that stop. If you mm. travel around the maze and pre-turn, A, you're faster because Pac-Man turns around the corners quicker than the ghost because they travel in sort of straight lines where you can travel around the corners very quickly. Um, but it's one of the first things that, you know, if I'm going to say to someone to improve your game, you need to do your pre-turns and to be what's called corner perfect. So at what point can you, you know, when you're coming up to a corner and you want to move down, at what point can you pull down in the joystick? Well, I normally, it, it, you'll probably see, it, especially when I'm running uh, my ninth key pattern, because I start from the beginning, I hold the joystick right, because as default, Pac-Man travels left, yeah? So you, that's another thing, you'll be careful running my ninth key pattern, is that at the beginning of every board, you have to hold the joystick right, otherwise you're gonna travel left. So as I travel right along the bottom, I'll let go of the joystick so it centers. And as I get near the the intercept point, I'll knock the, the joystick up. Certain people hold the joystick different ways. Um, and that's definitely, I watch Bill play, um, Dave, um, Dave Cruz play, you play, anyone else. Everyone's got a different way of holding the joystick. But mm -hmm. yeah, returns are so important. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, John, I think that's why probably like, you know, playing meme on a, using an xbox 360 controller whatever it's got eight way and i mean i know when i'm playing pac-man i think oh i'll move down and oh come on it's not moving down and you hesitate bang game over you need to just have the yeah the true kind of movement yeah that's true as an experience um xbox main bit main being the closest because it's an emulation it, th that's a good way of enjoying pac-man having some fun if you want to play it seriously you have to get an original board you have to because i I, and I know i play it so often I, I, I see the different way Pac-Man moves as well. There's certain he jumps at certain points on the original PCB and he doesn't do it in main. Um, but yeah, if you want to play it, they're difficult to get hold of. Obviously, it's easy to download main. But if you really want a, uh, an original game, play an original cab on a CRT, uh, get the experience. Isn't it? There's nothing mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Um, I've just touched that one. You've obviously you've you've covered this one here. You, you did tell me before, John, that there's different phases in the ghost movement which dictate what you can do and when. But you've just you've just covered that one. Um, this is a bit of a general question. Is there any recognised tips and strategies for playing the game for beginners, people like myself? Is there anything you could say do this, do that that will help your game immeasurably? Without doubt. Or just the, yeah, the first one is what I was trying to explain before, and that's to um, to do what's called pretends or to be you know, corner perfect. Mm -hmm. Because what you find is the first thing you do is you hold the joystick really tight and you push the joystick almost, if you push it harder, you can travel faster. When you panic, you say, run, run. It's to stay cool. The joystick, you'll only move when the joystick moves. Yeah. And you don't go any faster. But what you need to do is you need to remember to, to do a pre-turn. So as you come up to a corner, press the joystick up, you turn. If you want to turn left, turn it just before you get to the corner. You will always be ahead of the ghost unless you're eating dots and that makes you slow down. So it's the first tip is to definitely be, you know, at one with the joystick and make sure you can travel around. You can always practice if you've got main. There's no, you haven't put money in the machine, so it's not, you're not bothered. You can actually practice. Just go around the maze. Doesn't matter if you die, you've got lots of lives, you can put another credit on practice again. Just travel around the, the maze until you're really um, 
until you're, you're really experienced and going around without hesitating or stopping in corners. That's one of the most important things. Another thing is, is don't do what lots of other guys do and they watch me or someone else and say, oh, he plays perfect Pac-Man. Forget about scores. Forget about you know what other people do. Concentrate on your game. Set yourself a, um, you know, a, a, a line in the sand. So if your high score on Pac-Man's 20,000, that's your high score and that's the score you're going to... That's the score you're going to... Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Until you've incorporated everything that you know you've learned, don't set your sights too high because you've got guys who. I mean, I've got a close friend, um, Pat, and he keeps trying to play perfect games from board one. I keep saying to him, just carry on and go for a high score. Don't be, don't get too unreal. That's when it tends to get born and you you lose, um, you know, you lose interest. Always set your, your last score, your highest score. Even write your score down. Mm-hmm, and then, mm-hmm. You know, try and eat as many ghosts as you can. You take a few chances. But just always, when you've got a high score, aim for that score. Yeah. And like I said, once you've got your pre turns really dialed in, you, you, you'd be amazed how, how quickly your score will improve. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant.